we're talking about resurrection and Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the greatest preachers there ever was, never is, and so I'm going to let him and his words sort of preach with me today because he's a better preacher than I'll ever be. <laughs> but we're talking about resurrection and we're not talking about Jesus' resurrection, but we're talking about the miracle of resurrection that Jesus did. And it's not just Lazarus. There were about three resurrections that happened in the Gospels. And I'm going to quickly read through them because I think it's interesting to have them sort of read next to each other. So starting in Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate, excuse me, as he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bear, and the bear stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. Moving on over to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 9, starting in verse 18. While Jesus was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. And skipping down to verse 23. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the district. Now moving on to the Gospel of John in chapter 11, starting in verse 38. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you today seeking to understand what it is to be a resurrection people. To serve a God who looks at death and says, this is not the end. May you give us wisdom and courage today. In this we pray. Amen. Dr. King's talk of the blueprint lines gives us two points to focus on. His first, number one in your life's blueprint, he says, should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, your own somebodyness. I love this phrase because if you think about it and you hear the roar of the crowd, I love that image of they don't pan to the crowd, but a crowd of junior hires, black junior hires in Philadelphia who are hearing from their hero tell them that they are worthy 
that they are somebody. These words of worth and somebody are not given to the people of power and prestige, but it is given first to kids. I, I love that Dr. King thinks that at junior high you should have your whole life blueprint figured out. <laughs> but there is a sense in that that he looks at them not as children, but as future adults, as future change makers. He looks at them and understands that here is a crowd who, like himself, has been told that they are unworthy, that they are not dignified, and that historically, for hundreds of years in America, that they are not somebody. And he tells them that first and foremost, you need to know that you, you matter. It makes me think of these stories of resurrection that Jesus does not raise from the dead those who have it all together. He does not raise from the dead those who are walking around life with everything they need and all that they have. If you are dead, I think you've hit rock bottom. He looks at these three individuals and sees in them something worthy, some somebody-ness, and says, you have life again. I always wonder about the next day. The next day for this young man whose mother thought that everything was about to end for her. You see, in ancient Israel, if you were a woman, that was bad enough. But if you were a woman who was unmarried, you were basically out on the streets. And so for her, a woman who was widowed and had a son, a son who could provide for her, take care for her own property that would house her, her only hope is God. She has hit rock bottom. And Jesus comes to her and sees something in her and her circumstance that makes him stop and makes him bring new life where there was no life. This leader of the Roman people who intervenes while Jesus is preaching and teaching to the crowds, who is actually a person of power, but risks all of his status and power by coming and speaking and reaching out to this Jew who has a reputation for turning powerful people and structures on their head. And he risks coming and showing that he is powerless in this moment, that he has exhausted all matters and ways of saving his daughter's life. And he needs a miracle. Jesus intervenes. And he takes that young girl and gives her a second chance at life. Lazarus. Although I read the end of the story, Lazarus is one of the few moments in scripture where we see Jesus broken and wounded and hurting for the loss of his friend. We see the anger and grief that comes with death as Lazarus' sisters accuse Jesus, if you were here just one day earlier, this wouldn't have happened. Jesus intervenes and he brings life where there was death. Dr. King reminds us that Life is made up of understanding and having this deep belief of worthiness, of somebodiness. I think resurrection reminds us that we are somebody. That even in those death moments that we feel there is nothing more we can do, nowhere we can go, that all is lost, that we serve a God who says, hold up, wait. 
Resurrection is about to happen. Dr. King says, secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as the basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. He will go on in this speech to talk about if you feel so called to be a janitor, be the best janitor you can possibly be. I know myself included have been at times in my life where I'm waiting for something to change or something to be different or just for things to be a little less crazy and stressful. And when that happens, then I'm going to live. Then I'm going to do something. But what King reminds us, is that in everything we should live boldly. And what resurrection drives home for us is when we find ourselves in a second chance, it is a chance to live boldly. You got one life to live, what are you gonna do with it? It is about being intentional in our every day. It is about looking at life as a miracle in itself that is something that even when obstacles come in our way that we can find ways around them, over them, under them. We can call the community together and get the communal bulldozer to move them out of the way. But either way that we won't be stopped that we have a mission and a plan, we got a something in us that drives us forward to find a way out of no ways. Jesus' miracle of raising people from the dead, this miracle of resurrection, regardless of whether you believe Jesus rose from the dead, actually, or maybe, or I don't know what happened, but this metaphor, this idea that death is not the answer, that it doesn't have the last word, that even at the worst of times and circumstance, that there is still a comma. If you are been in the UCC for a long time, you know our symbol is the comma, and you know the phrase is God is still speaking. And I've always been asked as someone who grew up in the Pentecostal church of how can you be Pentecostal and UCC at the same time? Those just don't work. And I tell people, look at the comma. That's the most Pentecostal thing you possibly can say. God is still speaking. God is still working. God is still moving. God is not done. You may feel like things are done. <coughs> and that's fine. But God is saying, not yet. God is saying, what if? God is saying, can you put a comma where others put a period? And maybe even throw in an exclamation point. <laughs> Because church, no matter who you are, you are somebody. No matter where you're going, go boldly. Because we serve a God who looks at death and says, it's not the end. Amen? Amen. Amen.